who are you? Uh, just some basic information here, if you haven't already introduced yourself. And then what rhythm of praying the Psalms do you currently use or have you used before? I'm Denise Flanders, and I also teach Bible here. Um, in over the past, however long, I guess I've had a couple different rhythms of praying the Psalms. One, Hank sort of mentioned to you guys um, the Blue Book. <laughs> I brought these because I'll pass it around in case you're interested, so that you know what this is actually called. But um, one method I've used is praying the Revised Common Lectionary, which is one Psalm that you pray every day for a week. So Psalm 95 is the psalm for the week, and sort of like Greg was saying, I don't have to think about it. I turn to fifth Sunday after Easter, and here's my psalm for the week, and I pray that one psalm. That was your walk. I think that's more of a crawl approach, but that's like, or uh, it's the slow. There's a slow walk and a fast. Walk. I, I did the slow, slow walk. walk and the fast walk. So so when I was in seminary, a mentor gave me this, and that's why I started doing that. The same psalm every day for a week, and just marinating in it, and soaking at it, and, and seeing new things each day. Um, and the second thing I've done, which is what I'm currently doing, um, sort of because of community and the semester and the psalms that we're doing, is praying one psalm per day. And then I have a book that represents that too. So this is this is not a this is just starting with Psalm one one day. And this is a little Eugene Peterson devotional that I use that I like because I've got this psalm, but then he gives me a little hint as to but what's the psalm about? <laughs> like a little something before you start praying, and then something for after you start praying to focus you on like something meaningful within the psalm, so that I myself am not maybe overwhelmed by like okay, what well, I don't know what I'm going to take out of this today or whatever. So that's that's one psalm per day. So that's the fast walk. So those are two approaches that I've used. And I might as well just let y'all look at these in case anybody while we're talking like wants to write down the title or like see if it's interesting to you. Just make sure I get it back, okay? <laughs> uh, so Greg Peters, um, I do not teach uh, Bible here at Taylor. Um, as, uh, as Isaiah said, I teach in the uh, Honors College at Biola University. As I also say in my talk, I'm an Anglican, so I use the Book of Common Prayer. So, because Dr. Imes is not here, I'm going to get out my shiny distraction machine. <laughs> and uh, when I travel, I don't carry uh, a physical Book of Common Prayer with me. But uh, I used a Book of Common Prayer. So, I have not prayed evening prayer because of the busyness of the day. But tonight, uh, the Psalms appointed are Psalm 134, 135. Yes, yeah, Psalm 134 and 135. And uh, so, I'll, I'll pray those. Tonight, and then there's followed by an Old Testament lesson and a New Testament lesson. So, in this case, the Psalms are situated as part of a scripture reading program, um, if you will. And again, it's set for uh, my wife and I use a month long version of the Psalter. So, we're, you know, it's, it's going to average about like five a day between morning and evening prayer. And the other thing I'll say is so we don't pick them, we are given the Psalms each day that we should be reading for that day. Uh, but we pray them antiphonally when we pray together. So in the Book of Common Prayer, every verse is uh, kind of split in half, as the Psalms are usually anyway. And we do it back and forth so that you're reading a half of a verse and then you get to listen uh, to the other half of the verse, which we feel like is an important balance of, re of doing the, the vocalization of the, of the Psalm as prayer, but then also listening uh, to the other person vocalizing that half of the verse as prayer. Uh, well, my name is uh, David Dunham. I am a uh, professor and librarian here at Taylor University. I'm, I've been here for just about a year. And I am, I, I feel strange saying representing really, because I am a, 
a lay person or a very, very common person, as I've been saying, within the, the Orthodox Church, which is a communion involving uh, the Russian, uh, of national churches, basically, Russian, Greek, Antiochian, which is an Arab tradition, and, and multiple others that are all in communion with one another. So, um, in terms of my personal practice, uh, the church actually gives lay people a lot of latitude for our daily devotions and what we can choose. Although I do sometimes use uh, the rule of St. Pacomius, who is considered the, the father of what's called Cenobitic, if I'm pronouncing it right, monasticism, which or, or monastics that live together, like, like Benedict would, would organize at one point. Because many of the first monastics, of course, just went into the desert. And, but they were often became known for the holiness, so then a group of people would start gathering around them. Some of them would try to go further out and get away, and another group would gather around them until <laughs> they finally came to accept, okay, well, maybe I should be some spiritually responsible for these people. And, uh, but uh, the rule of St. Encomius involves Psalm 50, which is Psalm 51 in the West. Uh, 50 because we use the, the Septuagint of the Greek um, translate, I mean, we're based upon the Psalms in the Greek translation, um, which is, uh, just the beginning, I'll read the first verse. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according to the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Now, monks typically would typically do what is called a chrisma, which is Greek for a sitting, basically. The Psalter is divided into 20 chrisma, or 20 settings, and at each of the hours, which they will also talk about in, in the Anglican Church too, um, such as Vespers, Compline, you may have heard of some of those, uh, they will say the Cathisma on a cycle so that they are actually saying the entire Psalter, the entire Book of Psalms, on a weekly basis, and actually twice a week during Lent. Um, the average person like me does not do that. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, Taylor doesn't want to know what I'm doing in my office. Uh, <laughs> but some churches do, and some monasteries do, and so we always could have the option of jumping in at some point. Um, and the church I attended, actually, when I first became Orthodox, every Wednesday, uh, for kind of a Wednesday night service, did a section of the Cathisma. So, uh, I think that's good for an introduction. So my name's Hank, and the question's hot, what's our, what's our pattern? Yeah, who yeah. are you, who's your, what's your rhythm? All right, it's Hank. I, I kind of use the PWR method. So I make a plan, and then I work it, and then I review how bad I did my plan, and then I make a new plan, and then I work it, and then I review. So that's, that's my solemn method. Um, but I am hungry to learn how to pray. And I think that I found the way, the way, uh, to pray. It, it's in the Psalms. So, um, yeah, I'm, I am a walker, so I've done the slow walk, which is the one Psalm a week, and you kind of spend like you know maybe a half hour each day praying through that Psalm. I call that the Bonhoff method. And then I've done, you know, really, that's you know, in our marriage, like we have major tension because I'm a slow walker, my wife's a fast walker so fast. So the Johanna method would be the one psalm a day method. And that is um, that's been that's been a COVID grace for me. I, I started on like the, the I'm like, okay, we're gonna start a quarantine. We like started day one and we actually went through the whole Psalter in quarantine, you know, in a row. And then we started over last fall. We did semester in the Psalms, those of you who were in my classes. And now we're doing it again. And that's been a, a real blessing. So today's fifty six, Psalm fifty six, I think uh court's leading that right now. And um, it's been great to pray a psalm a day community. So, more of a walker. Uh, so the next question is, what is your favorite psalm? Or if it's too difficult to choose, what is your favorite genre of psalm? I really like that dashing your head against the rocks bit. That's my, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> 
we had more of those in here. Um, are we going to keep going in order? Or can we just anyone jump in? Yeah. yeah, I think um, it's going to sound a little strange, but um, Psalm 51 is is a traditional uh, evening prayer psalm. So that for the monks, they would often pray it every night. It sounds like that's part of the tradition uh, still in parts of Orthodoxy, at least. And that's that's as here at the first verse. But that's David's. So, you know, he, that's you know, he's sinned with Bathsheba and killing Uriah, so he's begging for God's mercy. And I mean, maybe, maybe we're all going to learn something. You're going to learn something about our personalities based on our favorite psalm, because um, you, you can read into it. So my, mine, I think, is actually Psalm 51, because you know, I, I find it so deeply personal to lament, uh, to to confess, and lament in that way one sin. Um, and, and, and at St. John's, when I pray with the monks, I heard it uh, very frequently. So the Anglican tradition, it's just one of the psalms that you're going to get to in that month-long cycle. But with the monks at St. John's, it was an evening prayer psalm, which is part of the monastic tradition. And so I think that really is my, my favorite psalm, uh, oddly enough. <laughs> well, I, I'll jump in because it kind of dovetails immediately off of that. Um, yeah, Psalm 51... Well, I would say originally for years I would have said Psalm 23 uh, simply because that's one that I had memorized as a child. And it, it's a beautiful psalm. You know, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Um, that should always be said in the King James. Um, <laughs> now, though, I would say that probably I'm going to go with Psalm 51 myself also, um, which it is said actually, well, seven times a day. And if you were doing the, the hours, all the offices uh, within the Orthodox Church. The cathisma is broken up so that a part of them is being said each time, but that one is repeated at the beginning of every cycle of the Psalms. And it's, it's extremely important, not just for penitence. I mean, it certainly is, is spectacular for that because you know, we obviously sin daily in thought, word, and deed. Um, but also as a reminder of Christ's mercy, have have mercy upon me according to thy great mercy, and I say there's something called the, the Jesus prayer, which is said commonly in, by a lot of Orthodox Christians, Christians, which is simply, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Which, I mean, first here sounds like, my gosh, I'm just groveling all the time, but. A lot of it is to re re remind us that mercy is like a very state and attribute of who God is. And that's a constant reminder, not only asking God to have mercy upon us, but remembering that he is merciful also. Um, so I guess I would say that that is. I think mine would be um, Psalm 27. And we shared a dinner too, and I, I guess uh, Dr. Voss has said the same, but um, this has been, I mean, there's so many psalms out there, but I, I really feel like Psalm 27 kind of expressing wanting to be in God's presence and and also like waiting on the Lord too um, in there as well. So um, I feel like sometimes in our prayers, we're really waiting on the Lord too as we seek for his presence. And, um, this kind of expresses that desire, as well as kind of a sense of confidence in the Lord at the same time, um, and expressing desire and confidence and, and a sense of waiting. All of that kind of really encompasses a lot of times when I'm praying, how I feel, and so I think something's up. Yeah, ditto. Uh, Dr. Young is my soul sister, really, because uh, Psalm 27 uh, is definitely my, my core psalm. And uh, I, in terms of genre, there, there's, there's, you know, you could count in various ways, maybe 15 types of tool, of soul tools in the Psalms. Um, but one, it, one that's interesting are called Holy History Psalms. And I find those super helpful uh, to, um, to reflect in God's work in the world. And then to write my own Holy History Psalms, my family's Holy History Psalms, and recognize how God's been at work in my life and my family's life. So Holy History Psalms are pretty cool. But um, but every every category is kind of like picking your favorite child. I, I don't I know, but I don't want to say that. So I'll, I'll just say ice cream. I've known it's hard. I don't know. Or it, it's really hard to pick your favorite child. I don't have a favorite. 
favorite psalm, like a specific one, but Hank did kind of out me that I kind of like, I, I like the imprecatory psalms, and I like the lament psalms, um, because I like scripture that makes me feel uncomfortable. <laughs> I like to read it and face it and ask the Lord, why am I uncomfortable when I read this? Um, so psalms that, like Psalm 6, I think of, that says, how long, O Lord? Um, I like them because they make me uh, like somebody asked, if I don't feel this way, who do I know that feels this way? I mean, I live in Muncie, which is 30 minutes from here. I get the Muncie local news, and every day I read a story about a child that's abused, a woman that's sexually assaulted, somebody who died because of gun violence. I read about this stuff that's happening 10 minutes from my house, um, and I can ignore it, or I can just despair over it, but lament and even imprecatory psalms essentially disciple me or guide me with what to do with that, right? Because they, they contain anger over injustice and they contain grief and sadness, but then they also contain pleading with God to act and expressions of trust. They always come around to trusting God for what he's going to do. So um, that's weird. But I like to be uncomfortable and I like to know what to do with all these feelings I have about this world that I see in front of me. Um, that I, I don't want to ignore and that I don't want to be in despair. And so those psalms help me with that. Well, thanks, um, so the next question is something that I've struggled with myself and trying to think through and that I'm sure a lot of people in here are also wondering. Um, so the question is, why would we want to pray other people's prayers? Uh, in other words, why should I want to pray the psalms when I can just pray my own prayers? Well, I'm an Anglican, so we cheat with other people's words all the time. <laughs> I mean, the whole, the whole Book of Common Prayer is someone else's word. So, but uh, not to always be the first to go, but I'm, I guess I'm that guy tonight. So, uh, <laughs> Benedict um, talks about... Uh, and if you go to a if you go to a monastery uh, like a Benedictine monastery, and they're not all the same. As I mentioned in my paper, monasticism is not monolithic. Um, the monks often, well, that's not true. I was going to say they often stand, but I've experienced both with some frequency. Um, anyway, they'll they'll pray a psalm, standing or sitting, and however they pray it, antiphonally or whatever they're doing, and then they stop, and then there's always time for personal prayer. After response after that psalm. And in fact, Benedict's uh, admonition that the prayer should not be prolonged unless under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit or uh, the inspiration of divine grace, some scholars think that what Benedict's actually talking to is that time of personal prayer that follows the communal recitation of a psalm. So I, I think, and I said this in my answer to your question as well, the psalms elicit a response from me. So if I, if I use the psalms words, you know, they're not my words, but they're going to elicit um, a response from me that will be my words, if you will. But I also think it's just good for us to be discipled by the words of Scripture so that they become our words as well. And I think that's, some, that's something that happens when you pray the Psalms regularly as you start adopting the, the psalmic language as your own, and it's no longer someone else's words. It is, in fact, your words. Um, those just a couple thoughts I have about you know, the Psalms inspire your own prayer, but you also need to, you, you come to own the words because they're no longer someone else's, but yours as well. I think probably along the same lines, probably when I'm going through something and I don't know, I don't have the words to express how I feel, um, I think the Psalms can help give those expressions as well. So praying those, because sometimes I, I feel like I could be overwhelmed, I feel speechless, I don't even know what to say as I sit there in prayer. And so going to the words of Psalms helps me in some ways to articulate some of the things that I might be struggling with or the feelings that I have. Yeah, I just want to say, you know, three things. Jesus, babies, and great great grandma. So I left um, my object lesson at home, but I had a hammer and toothpaste to bring. And I was going to slam the toothpaste with the hammer so you could see the toothpaste splash out. Because uh, when you get smashed with a hammer, what's in you comes out, right? So if I bang my finger, you're going to hear what's inside of you, right? So when Jesus was banged with a hammer, right, when the nails went through his body, 
what came out of his mouth were the words of three different psalms. So number one reason is because Jesus prayed the psalms every day. Number two reason is babies. Babies learn to speak by repeating their parents' words back to them, right? So the psalms are given to us by our Father to learn how to speak to him, to, like as kids, back to him, right? So uh, if you want to learn to speak in a way that God uh, would like us to speak, then we have to learn the psalms. And then third is great-great-grandma. So when I was your age, I, I went and interviewed my grandma because I knew someday she would die and I wanted to know about her life. My brother Matt just digitized those videos for Christmas for my parents, and so I watched a video that I haven't watched for 25 years. And I'm talking to my grandma, and I ask her about her grandparents. She says, well, my grandparents moved in with me when I was when we were five or six. And what I remember about my grandpa is that he would always sing the Psalms every night. It was his favorite thing to do, to sing the Psalms. And, and I'll, I'll tell you, that I don't think we can grow to be mature Christians without learning to pray the Psalms daily. At least if you look at the last 30 uh, centuries, or you look at the last 300 generations, I don't think you'll find anyone who's a mature believer who has not prayed the Psalms daily. Maybe there's an exception. If, if, you, if you know the exception, I'd like to, I'd like to see it. Jesus, babies, and our, our grandparents are coming for them. Um, I mean, just quickly, I'll I sort of echo what Dr. Young said, that it, it give, the Psalms give me a vocabulary, but also an imagination, right? So we were chatting about this, sort of beyond a vocabulary, but when we think of Psalm 1 and the tree that's like planted and rooted by the water, like that's vocabulary, but it also makes me envision what that means, right? Um, when we talk about the wicked being chafed and the wind that can never find a resting place. Like, that, I see that. I can feel that. So it, it gives me an imagination and I can experience something. Um, it starts with the words and the vocabulary, but it kind of goes beyond that. So. Well, I'll jump in here. Um, so much of what I would have said has been said, so you've got a lot of great stuff from everybody here. Um, I, I would say that why would I pray the Psalms? Why would I pray a written prayer as opposed to a contemporaneous prayer? Is number one, not an either or, because I asked a priest at this at one time too, and he actually gave me a metaphor of kind of a jet taking off. You know, that we, we can pray these prayers to just kind of get ourselves into the rhythm to always be doing them and that. You know, maybe we don't want to pray, but we just go ahead and say, I'm going to pray this psalm anyway. Um, and that's sort of like the jets, the power that it takes to ascend. And then once you're at this level, you're kind of at cruising altitude. And then you'll be perhaps more ready to also engage in some extemporaneous prayers at that point. So praying the psalms I mean, does not preclude your, your traditional prayers. Um, it's been said that they teach us how to pray. That is that is excellent. Um, they don't. Sometimes we don't know what to say is true too. And of course, the Psalms express basically every human emotion: you know, anger, sadness, joy, anything that we could experience as human beings. Uh, but one thing I was researching, researching that I came across that I really liked is that they guard us from praying selfishly. Um, because think of how many of our prayers are, okay, Lord, give me this, help me with this, help my friend with this, give me, give me, give me, give me. And I mean, God wants to hear our requests, of course, but there are so many other things that we can be praying for. And I find that with the Psalms and other written prayers, they make me think of things and pray about things that I ought to be praying about, but I wouldn't have thought of on my own. And so then it doesn't necessarily become just somebody else's words. It's like, oh yeah, I, I should be praying about that. Okay, well I will then. Um, and then I just will end with a psalm or any kind of written prayer is 
also great for those times of desperation where you know you talk you hear about the bible says the soul groaning within you there are times when you're sad you're miserable you're not sure if you even believe anymore but it's that it's the getting in a rhythm and just keep going you know, just pray the psalm you don't feel it you know it, well, number one it's not about emotion anyway so i mean if you don't want to pray the psalm pray the psalm um so if you don't mind i just wanted to pray a show a very quick prayer that's also um gets along these lines and this is from a uh, metropolitan fellow out of moscow who lived from 1782 to 19 uh, to 1867 and this is such a great one for when you don't know and it's oh lord i do not know what to ask of thee thou alone knowest what i need thou loveth me more than i know how to love myself O oh, father grant thy servant what i myself do not know how to ask i do not dare to ask a cross of thee nor consolation i only stand before thee with my heart open thou seest the needs that i myself do not know Look and work in me according to thy mercy. Spite and heal me. Spite and heal me, kill me. Cast me down and raise me up. I am reverent and silent before the holy will in ways that are unfathomable to me. I offer myself as a sacrifice to thee. Teach me to pray. Do thou thyself pray in me. Amen. Those were all great answers. <laughs> Um, this one is a little bit along those lines. Um, can't praying a psalm or any pre-written thing, for that matter, um, easily just turn into lifeless rote recitation of the words we're reading? Can't a prayer that you say on your own do that too? Dear Lord, thank you for this food. We love you. I mean, you know, that's sort of how I feel. Is any prayer can become rote and lifeless, right? A written one and a read one, or one that you just say yourself. I think you could have the, the danger could be there. Either way. Yeah. So my, I have two sons. They're uh, 19 and 16, so they're not terribly young. But we've been in a, a season for a while of uh, almost laughing uh, at, at table prayer in the evenings because we rotate through the family and we we noticed how we'd all fallen into just repetition, the same thing every night. So now we all. We're not trying to outdo each other, but we're trying not to fall into our own traps. And so what can sometimes come out is comical because people are trying to, they, I mean, it's, it's amazing how, you know, my 19-year-old my just will start praying and then I can, he, he goes right to the, the go-to prayer and then he's like, oh no, we're doing that thing where we can't go to our go-to prayer and then something bizarre comes out. Um, like, and, and for Nathaniel, who's going to go do this thing and amen, and Nathaniel's like, I'm not doing that. What are you talking about? You know, so, so. Again, I think it's just important to illustrate that we, we can't, it's not, there's nothing wrong with those prayers, obviously, asking the Lord to bless the food and nourish us with it. Um, but the way we were asking was, was flippant, and, you know, it was, it, was, it was just something we had fallen into, which, again, in and of itself is not bad. Um, I think, you know, from, from my perspective, because in, in all seriousness, if you've never experienced, you know, the Anglican Church, like, our, our Sunday service is I don't know 60% prescribed for me every week as the priest you know almighty God to whom all hearts are open all desires known and from whom no secrets are hid tons of thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit you know I mean the, the prayer of humble access uh, or the colic for purity that's the colic for purity um, you know it's just it's in my mind and I pray it sometimes when I'm not in the liturgy, but it has a place in the liturgy, and I'm called to pray it. Um, so I've come to terms with these things, again, to keep bringing it back around. I think when you do something long enough, you're not really reading it anymore. You're actually praying it genuinely. Um, you know, you've, you, you've made the language your own. Um, you, you, you understand what you're asking for by doing something repetitively. Does that make sense? Like, you know, you, the Psalms at first can be weird and strange and, you know, I mean, uh, might even have words you don't know. Like, you know, people elide the weird parts of some of the Psalms, you know, like Psalm 51 ends with, you know, the hills of Bashan and 
things like that. And you know, a lot of times people leave that out, but you know, that you, you talk about a stretch. You know, when you're sitting there reading a psalm and it's about you know hills you don't even know where they're at. Um, you've got to find a way to make that your own, and 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 um, some of that is you know a, a um, interpretive framework that you can bring to it mentally. But also, I think the the more you do it, the less you'll be reading, and the more you'll be truly praying it. And I, and I guess I'm. The only proof I have of that is my own life of prayer and being a priest. Because I, I, I don't, I would never come home from a Sunday service and say I did a great job of reading the service tonight, right? You know, like I, I, I would, I, I still think um, that I'm genuinely saying someone else's words as my own. Now, mind you, I can have moments in prayer and in the liturgy. Where you know, it's, have you ever been driving down the road and then you just come, you come to again, and you're like, how long have I been? Uh, that's not falling asleep at the wheel, but just that moment where you're like, oh my gosh, what just happened? You know, like how long have I been wherever that is? You know, and you know that can happen in prayer. That if you know the Psalms well enough, you can, you, you could, you could check out and come back and say, well, it's like three verses further along, and I don't even know where it was at for the last three verses, right? But again, that, that's actually saying something about the way you've owned the words, and you're inhabiting that, those words and making them your own. And, and I, I would just put the challenge out to you that, again, don't think in these dualistic terms, like wrote, extemporaneous, you know, wrote bad, extemporaneous good, you know? And instead, I would actually challenge you to take uh, Dr. Voss's challenge of praying the Psalms every day for the next 10 years. And at some point in those 10 years, you're, you're going to be like, I don't read the Psalms. I pray the Psalms. These are my words now. So. Yeah, I just want to tag on. Uh, Andrew Peterson is like probably one of my favorite poets. And he's got this great song called Be Kind to Yourself. So I make my students, some of you, I made, I made you listen to that. Um, the only reason you're here tonight is because you love Jesus and you want to know him more. You want to know how to pray. You wouldn't be here if you weren't here tonight, right? So... Yeah, just be kind to yourself and start praying the Psalms and watch what happens. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, I, I, this is just a different trajectory I was thinking about. Is like when we sing worship songs, you know, that's kind of like someone else's words too, and we can just easily check out. But then there's moments where we really resonate with those words and so I think you know um, and those are like contemporary psalms songs uh, expressions of our heart and stuff so what we have in the Psalter and so maybe on a contemporary way that we see it is even in our singing our worship um, we can actually you know take those and really own those when we're singing worship as well as well as checking out too. so in other words the the Psalter is the hill song uh, <laughs> of the engineers. <laughs> yeah, the, the, the OG, right? <laughs> That's good. Well, um, I was going to joke, you said turn it into lifeless recita recitation. I was going to say, you say that like it's a bad thing. Um, but no, I, I think there's something to be said for persistence. Um, think about the, the metaphor Paul uses in the spiritual life as basically and training and that's not something you always want to do I mean, you don't want to get up and run but if you're training you do it anyway because you know about the eventual benefits that might involve, be involved um, and I think about what Greg had said about personhood too I mean we uh, in the 12th century the idea of developing of the individual and such and we think that unless we're consciously meaning something or feeling it right now that it has no benefit but um, there are other levels of experiencing something I mean simply praying and saying I want to offer this time to you God is a way of communion with him um, so I would say that you keep praying even if you don't feel it because maybe this will lead you to pray tomorrow and maybe you will feel it then um, but you know, a baby worships God, and 
but there's no conscious thought going on necessarily. So, I mean, there are other levels um, of persistence. Cool, thank you guys. And this is the last question I have before we can have anyone else share a question. Uh, what is one piece of practical advice or one resource that you would suggest for those of us starting to pray the Psalms? I really want to recommend this book called Praying the Psalms. <laughs> <laughs> It's got an appendix at the back called Soul Work and Soul Care that walks you through how to pray the Psalms at a walking, jogging, or running pace. Um, Dr. Flanders you know, has these available to participants in our semester in the Psalms. So um, basically, if you've been part of that on Instagram, um, you know, sometime next week, I'm sure she's going to let us know how, to, how we can get our, our copy of this. Um, and there's that great story that Jesus tells about those who started at the beginning of the day and prayed all semester, and those who started halfway through the start the last week. But you know, hey, the point is to start praying the Psalms daily. So uh, you know, if you'd like to get a free copy of this great resource, you should start praying the Psalms daily tomorrow, and maybe you'll find out how to get your this, this copy of this great resource. I mean, I think, yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, I mean, a resource like that is great. I, I mean, you, you, you own a Psalter, I'm sure, because you own a Bible. But um, I, I might encourage you to buy a, a translation you're not used to and start with that. Um, that can be a little disruptive. Um, so uh, some of us were raised on the King James Version, and so that's not disruptive. Maybe for your generation, it's a little more disruptive. So, um, so that's one thing I would recommend. And then I would also, this is beyond the Psalms, but just we've been talking a bit about road prayers. Um, is it called about the Valley of Vision? The Puritan Manual of Prayer? So it has got some beautiful prayers in the Valley of Vision. Um, so you should get a copy of something like that and try when you're going through something to, I, I think they're, uh, I, can't think of the, I can't remember if they're organized by kind of topic or, anyway. Yeah, the, the point is, is like, get, get a book that has someone else's prayers uh, that maybe you could use in seasons of something you're going through and, and kind of intentionally pray someone else's prayer as a way to acclimate yourself to that, that kind of disciplined work. I, so I just talked about persistence and athletic training, but I would, I would say that one of my biggest pieces of advice, which I need to learn myself, is to give yourself a lot of grace, not let the good be the great be the enemy of the good, as they say. I mean, I, I have a tendency to set lofty goals, like I'm going to say these songs every day, and which I mean, you set that as a goal, because he's, but but I'm saying if you set that as a goal and you don't do it, don't let that kill the whole thing. Jump back on, you know, when you can, because I, as I said, I set lofty goals. I I find that I can't meet them, and then it can lead to just kind of doing nothing for a while. And so a little, I, a little bit is better than nothing. Um, the one other piece, I don't have a resource, but the other piece of advice I would give is in the Psalms, when you hit those imprecatory Psalms, and some of the ones that just seem to be about the nation of Israel and don't seem to have much relevance to us, understand that the early church interpreted most of the Old Testament, including definitely the Psalms, in the light of Christ. So like we sing a lot of the songs in the liturgy, and for instance, there may be some that are specifically written about you know, court uh, uh, ceremonies in the kingdom of Israel and the king and such. And so if we hit one of those, we typically interpret that you know, in terms of Christ enthroned at the right hand of God. So we can sing that to Christ. Or some of the ones about the deliverance of Israel specifically, the church is interpreted as in reference to Christ's redemption of the whole world. So I, I find it a little easier to sing, sing or some of those in that way. I shared my resources with you guys already, so I would say get one of those little books. And I would also say start small. 
Don't be like, I'm gonna read all the Psalms tomorrow. That's just probably not gonna happen. So um, I would say like start with a Psalm a day, you know. So read Psalm one tomorrow. Yeah, and and you all, most of you hopefully got a copy of this this resource. This is a great resource too. So you know, you, you start practicing, and there's room. Okay, my first time praying Psalm 24 on this day. Write the day down. You know, and, and uh, you know a little line about what stood out to me. You know, and the next time you get to it, you can do. You know, this is what stood out to me. And, and you know, I learned this from my mom because her Bible's got a million dates next to every verse because of. You know, but but over even if nothing sticks out to you the first time, it's gonna eventually you know, or you'll, it'll be cool to see that this could be a record for you of how God speaks to you through through each song. All right, uh, it's about eight fifty, so if people need to head out, that's totally okay. But if anyone wants to ask any questions. Yeah. Um, when Jesus' disciples asked him how to pray, he gave him the Lord's Prayer. So I'm wondering how you incorporate the Lord's Prayer, praying Psalms, and extemporaneous prayer into like one praying schedule, or how those all kind of come together. I guess that's for anybody. Yeah, just real quick, Bonhoeffer's got this great little book called Praying the Psalms, or Psalms, the Prayer Book of the Bible, and, and he starts with the Lord's Prayer. And he basically says, the Lord's Prayer encapsulates all 150 psalms. And so if, if you are looking where to start, we start by praying the Lord's Prayer every day. And um, it's not an either or. But that's, uh, those, every psalm is, is encapsulated or connected to the Lord's Prayer in some way. Prayer is so ubiquitous. I didn't even think of really mentioning it, but um, I mean, every single canonical hour, etc., it involves the Lord's Prayer. So it's it's one of those things that's easy we can memorize, and it's it's great to have on hand. Um, similarly, like. I know we've just done like three hours of this, but like, why the Psalms? Because there's like, there's other like emotional literature. Because like, I've been thinking this question the whole time. Why the Psalms? And I think part of the point is that like, it really touches like your like how you're feeling and like has a lot of emotion rather than like the pedigree or like the like all the theology that Paul writes about, right? But there's other emotional literature as well, and so like, why do we? hit specifically on the Psalms rather than, like, Scripture in general? So I think part of the answer to that is um, the Psalms were what, you know, um, were prayed in the Jewish tradition. And some of them at set times, right, we think the Psalms of Ascent were actually prayed as they went up to Jerusalem for feasts and things like that. Um, so to be honest with you, part of the answer, I think, is just tradition, you know, which now I feel like I should stand up and sing. And... Um, uh, which would be a terrible idea. And, um, but so tradition doesn't make it right. It's just tradition is what's been modeled for us. And I think we have to remember that the, the disciples and the earliest Christians were pious Jews. So they, they knew the Psalter. They prayed it. Um, so maybe when they said, how should we pray, Jesus understood that they weren't asking about the Psalter or not the Psalter, Jesus, you know, because they already prayed the Psalms. The other thing is, is I think this is where... Um, I sound like a broken record, but I guess like we're, we're kind of each year representing the traditions of sort. So in the Anglican tradition, it's, it's never just the Psalms. It's always paired with an Old Testament reading and a New Testament reading. So, you know, the daily and morning, daily prayer, evening prayer for us always has more scripture than just the Psalms. Uh, but, it, but it is true that we're, we're praying the Psalms a little bit differently than we are reading the lessons, um, if you will. But I, I would even recommend, no matter what, what way you think about it, feel free to... Um, to, to do that. But the monks always did kind of free word associations. So if you were reading a, a psalm, praying a psalm, and it had a word in it that made you think of something from Paul, then I then I would just say, like, yeah, finish the psalm and then go read the text from Paul. That's that's a great way to be reading the scriptures. Anyway, uh, praying the scriptures. Maybe. I, 
I tried to stick to the Psalms because that's the, the, the theme of the conference. Um, but I mean, I would say certainly everything he said, number one, and also that at least in my tradition, we would say that you have 2,000 years of prayers to pick from in addition to the Psalms too. I mean, Christians that have gone on before that have left us beautiful thoughts. So in that way, maybe we're commending like set prayers <laughs> alongside extemporaneous prayers, and of the kind of set prayers, maybe it's the Psalter is what we would say. It's kind of pride of place in that. We just wanted to frame it a little differently. How do you approach your regular rhythm of prayer, if that's the Psalms or whatever, when you're physically very tired? <laughs> Ooh, I have one. Um, I didn't mention this as a resource that I passed around, but there's also an app called the Divine Office, which is um, the Catholic, it's Roman, I guess it's Catholic, right? Is that right? I think it is. Um, but it will actually read you the day's prayers and songs. <laughs> Okay, I use that. So for for I didn't mention this in my like rhythm, but for a good amount of time, I was doing just the morning prayer of the the daily office. So it's just the daily office app, and there's a couple it, which is kind of neat because when you look at it, millions of people have downloaded this app, right? So you really actually get the communion of the saints feel. You know that millions of people are using this app to pray morning prayer, but there's one that will read it to you. So. If you want to listen to it on your walk to wherever or on your drive to wherever or if you're tired like you can listen to it I don't know that's one option and, and I use that unashamed, unashamedly <laughs> uh, when I when I can't myself crack the Bible and read I'll listen to it while you know when I go about my morning and get do morning prayer like that so another great option. resource I'm going to push Anglicans here at this point there's a <laughs> website called cradle of prayer it's a, a priest that, and uh, a lady who's a cancer who sings along with him, does the, the morning and evening prayer uh, in the, uh, from the Anglican Church. And they have posted it on their website in audio format for basically every day of the year. And they do an absolutely beautiful version. But lastly, I would say that when you are tired, it's much easier to read a psalm than to try to come up with something. At least I find that. Yeah, and that... that Cradle of Prayer is especially nice because if I remember correctly, he's got a nice southern voice, um, and I'm a Virginian, so I'm happy to hear that. But uh, the other thing too, Psalm 117 is the shortest psalm. It's two verses. Shouldn't pray that every day, but it, it is the shortest psalm. And uh, you know, uh, 119 will you know will always be broken up, but there's no there's no reason not to break up other psalms. And so I think like. I mean, Hank has set a pretty modest goal. What is it, Hank? One psalm a day is what you said? Is that I, the... I, I said pray daily from the psalms. So let's say you're pregnant and you, you're sick. Just to open a book makes you sick. Like to look at a page makes you sick. This was a situation that I've had friends in. Um, and this is pre-apps because that's a wonderful solution. But, you know, maybe you can just get one verse from one psalm. But we could pray that daily. So I'm just, my, 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 my rule is just let's pray from the Psalms daily. And I would say whether that's you know, a, a verse from a Psalm or the Psalm or a set of Psalms, um, let's, let's, let's start moving in that direction and see what happens. Pick the Psalm where David talks about being, feeling very exhausted and weak and whipped. There you go, that'll, that'll just fit. <laughs>
your vocational or your vocation that just so happens to also be your spiritual life, if that makes sense. But um, I think it's really important that you separate what you're studying and your devotion. <coughs> so I will not necessarily, like if I'm working on a passage or if I'm uh, doing something, I will not use that as my devotion in any way. I would have to set aside time that I'm, that I, I'm spending with the Lord, where I, where I have my own rhythm in that as well, that's separate from my work. So I don't want them to just necessarily, I mean, of course it like, flows into it throughout the day, but I, I want to have something that's, I guess, special in some ways before the Lord, that this is my time with Him, and it's not just going to flow into my work, and like, and that helps me mentally, and that instead of like, oh, well, I'm going to read the psalm today anyways, or I'm teaching Biblia, Biblia 1 on the psalm, so this is my devotion. I don't want that to be, and I, I'm very careful to make sure that I spend that time alone with the Lord daily, and I, I, I try and protect that time with him and then move into whatever work that I need to do um, and see that as part of my ministry and how I'm serving the Lord. And if they, I mean, if I have to read a psalm or uh, during the morning or something like that, that just kind of dovetails to my work, then that's different than just seeing that as just an overflow to, like, feed my spiritual life. So, because I, I feel like that, I lose focus then sometimes and just, it all just blends together. Yeah, there's not this rhythm of rest and work even on a daily basis. I mean, I. Go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, is the question how the your own personal study actually fuels or invigorates your academic study, or no, no, no. how do you not how do you not let that kind of get in your? Yeah, how does oh. this specifically yeah. impact your ministry? or your vocation that is your spiritual life, basically? Um, I don't know. Yeah. Does this specifically impact you besides your academic study? Well, one quick thing for me is that I usually read up a psalm in the morning, and I consciously see how God speaks to me through the prayer that I'm praying of the psalm. And there's almost always like a verse, a phrase, a concept, an image that really strikes me, and I carry it with me throughout the day. So I ask the Lord to, like, I, I say, I'm going to focus on this. I want to think on this. This is my word of the day or my image of the day, which Hank told me is a long-rooted tradition somewhere that I didn't know about. <laughs> but, um, so I'll, I'll say my, my, my image today, going back to the tree in Psalm 1, it's I'm rooted and I'm grounded. And that's because of who Christ and the Lord is in my life. And I, I carry that with me throughout the day. That's what May was saying, separate from my own personal study. But I teach Bible, so I carry that image of being rooted and grounded in the Lord into my Biblia 1 class or whatever, my faculty meeting or whatever, you know, whatever I'm doing. So I don't know. Maybe that doesn't really answer the question. But I do kind of separate it out. But it actually invigorates my life to, to read a psalm and be and really connect with something, like have the Lord connect me with with something. But I'm a very visual person too, so I, I'll draw on that throughout the day, no matter what I'm doing. Yeah, so what I was hearing you ask was something like, okay, I'm writing this paper on Ephesians and I just spent time in Ephesians. That's kind of my devotions, or like, or I can't muster the energy to go into my devotions because I just spent hours in Ephesians. So I, I think what, what May says is great. Um, I mean, it, it's important to separate it, but I, I want to give you a piece of advice that I wish I would have gotten a lot earlier in my own career, which was, why didn't I treat my study as a kind of prayer? And, and I don't mean that from a, from a subject matter perspective, because I mean, I majored in Bible, Bible, theology, theology, but that my vocation, your vocation, your calling right now from God is to be a student. So by being a student, you are living into your godly vocation. And that means your study is doing exactly what God wants you to do. So you can make that a kind of prayer. It shouldn't replace what was suggested. Like try to separate something, but like no one told me <laughs> that I could approach my, my intellectual life prayerful. I mean, not, 
not because I prayed before I started doing the work, but that the work itself was, you know, a vocation from God and therefore godly and therefore a kind of prayer, something that I was offering back to God. And to be honest, that's the only thing that sustains me 16 years into being a full-time professor is, I mean, it's, it's still easy just to get up and think about, like, the task for the day and, you know, Lord, deliver me from the rest of the semester because I'm ready to be done, you know. <laughs> But, but to go and meet yet again with students or to correct yet another misplaced comma, to think of that as like by doing that work in a godly way, it is offering something back to God, myself, and, and those kinds of things. And so I think that might be just a little reframing um, because I spent way too much time of my life thinking of this kind of study and then study ends and then maybe prayer begins. And I was, I was, I was training to be a theologian. And uh, I didn't make that connection. So there's, you know, I mean, it's easy for academics to throw books um, out, but you know, there is a book out called Theology as a Way of Life, which I think really kind of orients this. And I, I would just say, like, scratch the theology part and put any discipline there, and, and that could be a helpful reframing. It's not a replacement, obviously, for intentional time of, you know, psalmic prayer or extemporaneous prayer with God. But I think we drive too much of a wedge between those two things. And again, if this is your vocation, then you're right where God wants you. So by doing it, you're that is a form of prayer and worship to God. Is it, are we gonna wrap up soon? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think we're gonna wrap up now. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> If you have any other questions, uh, you can feel free to stay after and talk to whoever stays here. Uh, thank you guys for coming. Thank you to U5 for participating.